Tonight's reading through our text is from the book of Romans, chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, down on page 943 in your view Bible. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own action. For I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. Though it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want to do, that is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I no longer want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law, that where I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's begin in prayer. Now, Lord God, just open our hearts tonight to your presence. Fill us as we hear your word. Let it work deep into our hearts. As we look at the enemy within, Lord, let us look inside and see the sin that we struggle with. And we may come to you. And we may find in your cross and in your love and in your forgiveness strength to live each day. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. We started this week on Tuesday nights a Bible study called The Enemy Within. And it's based on this chapter of Romans. And so we're going to talk about it tonight, literally, the enemy that is within. Okay, hang on a second, let me get this going. That goes. Okay. Have you ever, you're just going along, minding your own business, everything seems to be fine, and then suddenly something happens. A car cuts in front of you. Someone steals your parking spot. They knock it, they run into your grocery cart. I don't care. It's your kids act up. And all of a sudden, from just being nice and calm and happy, you explode. You blow up. You yell, you scream, you just go berserk. Or maybe it's that you get to a point where you've got anxieties and fears or anger and depression, and you just keep these thoughts going over and over and over in your mind, and you do everything you can to break them. Literally called the law of sin. And we see 
that in the book of Romans. It says, for to set our mind on the flesh is death, but to set our mind on the spirit is life and peace. We have a choice in our life. Do we set ourselves on the mind of the flesh, live in the sinful nature, or do we live by the spirit? And that struggle comes out in Romans 7, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want, that is what I keep doing. We all struggle with that. So this enemy, literally called the law of sin. Sorry. I'm going to read this quote. This is from the book of study. The law of sin doesn't work on us from the outside. We carry it within us. It is inbred, working, compelling, and urging us from the shadows of our hearts. Paul calls it sin living in me. The evil that is right there with me. Another law at work in the members of my body. And the law of sin at work in my members. In verse 18 he says, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. The law of sin in some sense is Paul. The reality is we are sinful. Now, we all know that because if you give me one toy and two babies, I'll prove it to you. Alright? The truth is we are, we are all sinful. It's actually in our very DNA. When I used to, uh, when I used to do a no for good, be out to be surrounded by farms, that's where I learned the wonderful fact that everything you eat is poison. I don't know if you know that or not, but everything you eat is poison. Every piece of corn, tomato, lettuce, whatever it is, even the cattle, and the, it's poison. Why? Because we live in a polluted world. All right? They put the herbicide, the pesticides on the fields, it runs down the streams, it gets into the water, it gets into the roots of the, of the crop, and it gets, sucks it up, and it literally becomes part of the crop. Now, it's not enough there to heat to kill you or hurt you, but the reality is you cannot separate it from the actual fruit. You cannot separate it from the meat that you eat. So even things that say they're organic are better than but there's not a spot in this world that's not polluted. There's just not one spot. You can't find anywhere in this world that's not polluted. Okay, it's in the DNA. It's the same with us. David put it this way. Purely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. I was born warped. Now, physically not. But spiritually, we're warped. We're born corrupted. We're born sinful. It's in our very DNA. As the old hobo comic strip went, we have met the enemy and he is us. We have the enemy that we struggle with inside of us. This means that you need to understand that there is a very much a part of you that is working to seek to destroy God's work in your life. Seeking to separate you from the salvation that God has won for you in Jesus Christ. There's a part of us that is fighting that. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. This, this enemy, this sin within me. Okay? We're talking about how does it work? How does this sin work? It seeks to deceive us. Our text says, for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. Or in James, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The desire when it is conceived is birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. Do not deceive, my beloved brothers. Satan wants to deceive us. Sin wants to deceive us. It wants to trade. What's a con? Maybe that would be a better way of saying it. The reality is it wants us to deceive to think it's what we need instead of God. So it works in us certain ways. First of all, the enemy works in us by offering us rewards for sin. The blessing of sin on reward it offers. You all go out and you get drunk. You feel good for a couple hours. And that feels great. Sometimes sin feels really good. It offers a reward. Now later on, the Holy Spirit comes in and flattens you and you feel guilty there. But at that moment, it feels good. I mean, we sin for the rewards, for the alcoholic. It's that feeling of invincibility when they're drunk. For the drug addicts, it's that high and that feel good for a 
for a few moments for the for the secondly uh, sinful. It's those it's that feeling of the climate. For the gospel. It's that feeling I know something you don't know. And I'm better. For the light, it's the excitement of getting away with something. For the proud, it's a reinforcement that they're okay. The reality is it goes on and on and on. Sin deceives us by telling us that whatever is right in front of you now is better than what God has already given you. Okay? Think back to Garden of Eden. Alright? What does it say? It says, Satan there deceived Eve by doing what? He said, If you eat this fruit, it will make you like God. You will know good and evil. And then the Bible says, And Eve, looking at the fruit, apple, whatever it is, says, See that it made her wise, and that it was good to eat, to the bite. It looked good at the moment. At that moment, it looked good. Now she backed away a bit, and God, remember what God said, she wouldn't touch it. But at that moment, it looked good, and so she took it. And that's exactly what happens. At that moment, whatever it is, it looks good. We want that reward. It feels good to blow up sometimes, doesn't it? The reality is, sin works by rewarding us. And we suck into it. The second thing it does is it offers us punishment if we don't. If I don't go along, if I don't do what my flesh wants, then I feel I'm going to be punished. Say, well, my life's going to fall apart if I don't do this. I can't not do it anymore. Or my friends, my spouse, my children, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, they're going to reject me. They're going to be mad at me if I don't go along and do this. People will think I'm weird, that I'm different. I won't be accepted. I won't be loved. I'll be miserable. Well, you can sit there and beat yourself up and just say, it'll just let you continue to do that and do that and do that until you're absolutely miserable and you just want to crawl home. If you don't go along, you're going to be punished. The enemy will fight everything to draw you closer to God. The flesh hates everything about God. Since it resists everything about God, it resists every way we try to taste Him and know Him and love Him. And the more that something enables you to find God, the more Satan will resist it. The idea is, you can sit and watch a movie, an action movie, whatever kind of movie you like, and you can sit there for two hours and not think of nothing but that movie. But get on your knees for five minutes and pray and see how long you can keep focused on God. Okay? You can read for hours. But pick up that Bible. 30 seconds later, you're gone. And you're tired. And if you put that Bible down and you go back to the other thing and you read for another three hours. You think that is? Why is it you can never carry a conversation on, never get sidetracked for, for a long? But the moment you sit down on your knees to pray or think about God for a minute, boom, 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 your mind's going everywhere. That's sin inside us, folks. That's the battle with the flesh that we deal with. Sin doesn't want you to grow close to God. It's really crazy, but it's a reality. Part of me doesn't want me to grow close to God. God, part of me wants me to. That's the new creation in Christ that God has given me. But the reality is, part of me doesn't want to, and I need to be aware of that. The enemy separates the outward from the inward. <coughs> we just did a Bible study, those who wrote to that, the screw tape letters. And the reality is, it's group tape players that talks about the fact that Satan doesn't mind if you go to church. Doesn't care at all. You go to church every week and we'll bother and leave. As long as you don't pay attention to what's going on. And you can sing hymns all you want. As long as you don't pay attention to the words you're singing or who you're singing it to. You go to Bible study and learn all kinds of things as long as it's just knowledge to you and you never apply it to your life. You see, as long as we keep the outward from the inward, Satan's happy. Okay? And we all do it. We all do it. Mike has a rotten day. And I walk up to him and I say, how you doing today? You know what he's going to say? Fine. Right? We'll lie right through our teeth. Okay? We can be absolutely miserable, but 
but I'm telling you that because the outward doesn't reflect the inward. God works in here. In our soul, in our heart, to fill us with his love and his presence. He gives us the power of the Spirit to grow. And if Satan can separate it so your outward actions and your inward actions aren't the same, <coughs> he can separate from God. Number eight, the enemy takes our mind off Christ. The enemy will fill you up with anything. Again, you can spend three hours worried about something. A job, maybe how to pay the bills, maybe a relationship. I don't care what it is. You can get yourself and you can spend hours worried about something. You know what? You'll never think of anything else. But spend five minutes trying to glorify God and to praise God and see how it will happen. Literally, Satan don't care if he wants to, I don't care if he wants to tell you, but he don't care if he wants to sit there and fill yourself with television for hours. He'll let you do it. But when you get to time where it's focused on God, to take through your devotion, to do your prayer time, to do your time before God, boy, everything will come in your mind. You'll think of every job you've got to do for the next two weeks all at once. Why do you think that is? It's because literally Satan is controlling, fighting, our mind. He's using us against us. And against God's spirit in us. This is my favorite one. Sin turns the enemy into pets. Or the enemy turns sin into pets. We got our pet sins. I mean, we all said, I got my pet peeves, right? I got my pet things. I don't like this and I don't like this. Or we say, well, yeah, I know it's, but it's only right. That's okay. We make, we make pets out of sin. We, we think they're harmless. Kind of like, I mean, even going with the movie Gizmo, or uh, Gremlins. I love that movie. Yeah, that's good. Alright? And you get this cute little fuzzy thing called Gizmo. Yeah, I had to ask earlier. I couldn't remember. Gizmo. And he's cute, and he's fuzzy, and he's fun, and he's cuddly, and you play with him. Just don't get him wet or feed him after midnight because that literally all heck breaks loose. That's exactly what we do with sin. We kind of go, well, I know I shouldn't do that, but oh, it's not going to hurt. And I know I should spend more time with God, but yeah, it's not going to hurt. Or I know I should, I should listen more to my wife and, and, and care about her more, or whatever. And we do it. We play games with it all the time. And we play with it like it's a little fuzzy pet. Until it eats your face off. That's exactly what happens when we allow sin to become a pet. Sin is a pet. Sin kills. Okay? The enemy seeks to separate the remedy of grace from the design of grace. Okay? Oh, to read this quote, you must understand this. The flesh weakens conviction against sin by separating the remedy of grace from the design of grace. Scripture teaches nothing more clearly than God's design in showing mercy is to make us holy people. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodly and his worldly passions, and to live a self controlled, up life, and godly life in the present age. Okay? Sin redeems us, forgives us, that's the remedy of grace, it cleanses us, but it then makes us holy. Okay? The goal of grace is not just forgiveness. It's to make us holy in Christ. Mark Luther put it this way. Now just as God our Lord is holy, so his people are also holy. Therefore we are all holy if we walk in faith. For he who is a Christian enters with the Lord Christ in the sharing of all his goods. Now since Christ is holy, he too must be holy, or else he must deny that Christ is holy. If you've been baptized, you put on the holy garment, which is Christ. In other words, God makes us holy. The goal of salvation is to make us holy, to make us in the image of Jesus Christ. So the Bible tells us. Okay? But when we separate that, when we only think about grace in terms of forgiveness, what you do is you, it's like having a water fountain. You go and get a drink whatever you want, but it doesn't affect your life in any other way. We think of grace only in terms of forgiveness and 
not as God's power, God's grace, God's the ability to be and live holy through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. What you've done is you've just turned it into nothing. And that's what Satan wants to do. He wants you to forget about the goal and only focus on the remedy. So he can tell you to go ahead and sin. It's no big deal, God, forgive you. And I guarantee you, you've thought of that sometime in your life. When you've been thinking about doing something here, if you've been walking with God any length of time, you say, well, I've got to forgive me. You do it. We're just separating the remedy from the design. He said to me, this is what he does. He hides in our lives. He hides in plain sight. He hides in our very heart. This sin, this enemy within, literally comes into our very heart. I love this Ecclesiastic song of different Solomon. The hearts of children of men are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts where they live, and after that they go to death. In other words, your heart's full of evil, it's going to drive you nuts, and then you're going to die. Pretty blunt. Alright? Jesus put it this way. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles the person, what makes us sinful. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. And in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand? And that's following the quote I left in your sermon notes because it's such an important one. And it's how Satan works because we don't pay attention to the fact that he's in our very heart. It says Satan uses all kinds of disguises. He is so effective that he can acquire almost total control of the Christian's life, while the victim doesn't even suspect the identity of his evil master. So the God of unrighteousness is ordering the steps of his life. A person can even feel confident and secure. This deception is perfect for the first mask of devil is self. He hides as yourself. What can be more subtle than the satanic suggestion which arrives in your own mind and your own idea? It never occurs to many people to look beyond their own behavior patterns to see if anyone has had a hand in it beside themselves. The reality is we don't think about that. We don't realize that Satan literally is suggesting, tempting, pushing, pushing us a direction. That sin inside of us is actually seeking that. And so we don't even realize, why am I thinking this? Why am I so upset at this? Why am I responding the way I am? Do you ever think it might not be you? But as Paul says, the sin that is within you, most of us don't spot the enemy within because we're not looking for it. We're not paying attention. So how does this enemy become known? is revealed through the law, through the Word of God. What shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet, if the law had not said you shall not covet. Now what Paul is saying here is that I did the sin, I just didn't know it. And then when God's Word comes, He shows me, through the God Word of God, my sin. Through the Ten Commandments, He shows me my sin. That's why we Talk about that, friends. That's what we're going through and memorizing them again. Because the reality is, they show us our sin. Or in Hebrews, it puts it this way. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and spirit of joints of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God's law exposes it. It literally exposes you. Okay? Naked and exposed. Those are the scary words to me. But that's who we are. That's what God's word does. It exposes, it exposes all your garbage. You can pretend and you can make everybody in the world think you're a great person. You can, you can have all your act together and different, but God knows the truth. And God's word exposes that truth. And it's the truth straight down enough. Literally nothing. The law of God will expose your sin. It will destroy your heart. It will decimate your self-image. It will flatten your self-esteem. And it will reduce you to 
the point of seeing what you are really in God's eyes without Christ. It was like the steam one. It was all this damn time in the place. But that's a good thing. Believe it or not, that's a good thing. When God's word makes you feel miserable, that's a good thing. Because then we take hold of Christ. After Paul gets through this whole writing of all the struggle he's having, he finally just throws his, air, his hands up in the air and says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, and my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin. Billy Graham put it this way. Ten commandments are a mirror to show us just how far short we fall in meeting God's standards. And the mirror of our shortcoming drives us to the cross where Christ paid the debt for our sin. Forgiveness is found at the cross and no other place according to the Bible. Or again, Luther said, this is the touchstone, the struggle that we have. This is where it comes real is what he's saying. Which teaches you not only to know and understand and know our own sinfulness and really understand who I am, but also to experience how right, how true, how sweet, how lovely, how mighty, how comforting God's word is. Wisdom beyond all wisdom. It's at that point when we grab on and say, God, I need you. When we realize that that's what God has been trying to get us to understand. Is it sin? Is it going to be coming? But not only for God, that we find out just how much God does care and how much He loves. So how do we defeat Him? How do we defeat ourselves? How do we defeat this enemy within us? Well, the truth is you don't. You never will. But Christ has. We have. We won't. But Christ has. So if you want to destroy the enemy within, you're not going to do it. So what do I got to do? I got to focus. I got to focus on Christ. I got to focus on Him. So there's three things to focus on. Number one, focus on the cross. Now the cross shows you two things. First of all, the cross shows you exactly what you deserve. Ever sit down, watch the passion of Christ, watch the whole thing, and realize that should be you throughout the whole thing. You'll have no appreciation for cross will show you exactly what you deserve and God's punishment for sin. Then we focus on the goodness of God because it was Christ who paid for all our sin. It was God who took all that upon himself, all that punishment, all that hate, all that vindictiveness, all that hell. He took upon it and that's how much he loves you. And that's how valuable you are to him. And how beautiful you are in his sight. And third, we focus on the word. Because that's the power of God unto salvation. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So the truth is, you have an enemy within you. You have an enemy within you. I have an enemy within me. We need to recognize that. We need to pay attention to it. But that enemy has been defeated already by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's an enemy that may roar like a lion, but he runs like a coward. Is this the devil the scripture says that he will flee from you? Why? Because of Christ. It's an enemy whose root is gone, whose power is broken, whose control in your life has been shattered. So, an enemy whose very attacks against you can turn you back and drive you back to the grace of God, the power of God, the forgiveness of God, and the grace. Back to that promise, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of the sin and death. You and I have an enemy within us. But it's an enemy that's been defeated. And an enemy that cannot stay on the cross. Cling to it. And watch your eyes. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus from this day forward.